So you've told The Telegraph you're going to be striking from the north of Scotland down to the tip of Cornwall. Why do you want to see strike action? We don't want strike action. This is a defensive action against the companies and the government, in fact, who are bringing in stringent cuts, thousands of jobs of our members, some thousands have already gone, and there's thousands more to go. They also want to completely change the conditions that our members have agreed with their employers. And we haven't had a pay rise for a very long time. Many of our members are now in the third anniversary of not having a pay rise. They worked all the way through COVID. Uh, they mainly had to work at work, not uh, staying at home, working online. And they're fed up with it. They want to have job security. They want to provide a service for the public, but we do need a pay rise to keep up with the rocket in inflation that we're all experiencing. You say that you need a pay rise. Um, the average UK salary is £31,000. The average railway salary is £45,000. No, that's not correct. Well, what's the correct number? The median salary for a railway worker that we represent is £31,000. It's exactly in line with the average. Um, so, but given the fact that you know it is in line with the average, um, why some people you know look at watching and listening to this will be wondering why it is that you do deserve a, a pay rise ahead of others. Well, all British workers deserve a pay rise. There's a bit of a nonsense that goes around, especially in the media, that says if we get a pay rise, somehow other workers uh, won't get a pay rise, or if we don't get a pay rise, it will be transferred to nurses, to, to other public sector workers and people that are also being exploited. That just won't happen. If we don't get a pay rise, the profits of the companies will just go up. And what needs to happen in the UK is that some of these profits need to be reduced so that British workers can get a pay rise. Every worker in this country is struggling at the moment. They can't keep up with the utility prices. They can't keep up with their household bills. We need a pay rise. But we also need job security because there's a lot of precarious work and vulnerable work at the moment, and that's got to end. If you're saying that everyone deserves a pay rise, are you not worried about the impact that this could have on inflation, which is, you know, the very thing that everyone's really concerned about? You know, the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, calling for pay restraint because it could... Well, his pay restraint, he's on £600,000 a year, as is the chief of Network Rail. There are railway bosses taking home millions of pounds every year. The railways made £500 million of profit last year when uh, fares and passengers were at an all-time low. People are stripping money out of the railway. They're stripping money out of the economy. And if workers' wages don't go up, it means a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. We've got more billionaires than we've ever had in this country. The rich have never been richer. And the reason they're able to do that and get richer all the time is because they're deliberately depressing workers' wages. Inflation has come on board now and virtually nobody's had a pay rise for the last two or three years. So this idea that there's a wages price spiral is nonsense. I totally get, um, and I'm sure many of our viewers will, will share, you know, your assessment of the very, very high uh, wages, particularly the high wages of those people calling for pay restraint. Uh, but it doesn't change the facts, though, does it? That... If, if lots of people get pay rises, then it could lead to inflation. Well, inflation is already here. And nobody's it could had lead a to more inflation, right? Well, it could lead to more inflation, but what could also stop inflation is that some of the companies could restrain their profits and return that money into lower prices. BP and Shell and the others are making record profits of billions of pounds every quarter, never mind yearly. They don't, they've got so much money they don't know what to do with it. One of the things they could do is sacrifice those profits, never mind a windfall tax, what about a dividend that goes back to the people that are consuming their, their materials? But also, we've got thousands and thousands, if not millions of people, who are struggling and while they're working are having to take benefits. That's an outrage. The reason they have to take benefits is they're not being paid enough and they need to be paid more. OK. Uh, now, just talking about the strike action, do you think it's now inevitable? Well, we're talking to the companies. We're talking to the companies at a very senior level, but they are taking a very hard line. They want to impose these cuts while they're imposing record increases in fares. Their uh, fare increases are linked to the retail price index, so, so the, but our the, wages aren't. The question is, do you think the strikes are inevitable? I can't see a way out from the strikes at the moment, unless there's a breakthrough, unless the government instructs these companies, which they are doing, to, ch to change their line rather than harden their line, it's very, very likely that there'll be strike action and it'll be very soon. And what, what level of pay increase would you like to see for your members? Well, I'll negotiate that with the companies. There's lots of ways to put value into a package. But just but, give us a rough idea. Well, we want to see something that reflects the ever-increasing costs. Our anniversaries for these companies were back in December and back in uh, April. So does that mean you'd like to see it roughly the same levels as inflation? Well, it needs fair? to meet the aspirations of our members, which coincide with inflation, yes. So roughly around the, the level that inflation currently is? Well, that's what so they need eight, to do to keep eight, up. To Otherwise, our people become poorer. 8 to 10%. 
Well, we'll talk to the companies about that. OK. Uh, now, millions of people across the country are gearing up to make good use of the extra bank holidays to celebrate the Queen's mm. Jubilee. Um, and yet there are planned strikes on the London Underground. Well, uh, there's you... not. We've called off a strike next Friday. We've got a, a way forward on that, which is on one of the public holidays. So there's no strike action by the RMT over any of the Queen's Jubilee or, celebrations. On both the June the 3rd and June the 6th? Well, June the 6th is after the celebration. OK, but it's still on the bank holiday, though, isn't it? Well, the bank holiday is Thursday and Friday. This is a normal work day on the Monday. Uh, OK, right. So you've... <laughs> all right, OK. That's where we are. So you've, 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 you've called off one of the strike actions, but how, how, how worried are you about the disruption that it could cause people and the sympathy that you might get? Well, we don't want disruption. It's a hard road being a trade unionist and taking industrial action, but we feel we have no choice. The London mayor is attacking our people. He's attacking their pensions. He wants to make them poorer permanently, not just while they're at work, but while they're in retirement. It's exactly the same agenda that the government's putting forward through these funding negotiations with the companies and with the London mayor. We cannot sit idly by as a trade unionist while our, while our people are being attacked while they're at work, while they finish, when they finish work through retirement, and the very threat that they may lose their jobs. It's my job as a trade union leader to defend our people. And this is a defensive strike, if it happens. Their tanks are on our lawn. We're not threatening them. They're threatening our people. If you're looking ahead to the summer, do you think we could see, you know, a summer of discontent? Well, there are a lot of workers that are very upset. I'm, I'm seeing that there's action going on in the local councils. We've got refuse workers, we've got care workers. Most people who come from traditional working class environments find themselves super exploited. Not only have they got poor wages, they've got poor conditions, if they've got any conditions, but they also find themselves under the threat of cuts, uh, and that being job cuts. So there has to be a response from all of the trade unions and from the TUC. And, and we would sort of like to see the Labour Party and its leadership come in behind working class people so that they ensure they get a pay rise, so there's some support from the politicians as well as from the trade unions. Wow. And this is, this is a measure for Keir Starmer, so that he can decide whether he's on the side of the workers in this country or on the side of the bosses. Do you think that he hasn't made that clear, then? He hasn't made it clear at all. I've not heard him say once uh, during the current dispute, such as at the Co Coventry uh, Council, where the, the Labour Council sought to cut workers' wages and cut their conditions. I've seen no response from the Labour front bench that says we support the workers in their struggles. And that is the role of a Labour party. The name gives it away, that they're, support, they're there to support the Labour movement. Do you think that Keir Starmer's on the side of workers? I can't see it at the moment. Wow. And so what do you think that means for the, you know, the funding of the Labour Party and the union support for the Labour Party? Well, my union's not affiliated to the Labour no. Party, but I see many other unions, general secretaries and leaders, thinking, what is the point of this connection? If we just get this bland democratic party sitting in the centre of... Uh, politics, taking their, their instructions off the Daily Mail to some extent and not actually getting behind workers' struggles, you'd have to ask yourself, why do they call themselves the Labour Party? So we need to see a strong line. The Labour Party needs to get back into working class communities, support better wages and support the end of precarious work, which is outsourced, subcontracted and vulnerable work where you don't know where you're going to get your next week's work from in terms of these flexible hours contracts and zero hours contracts and all the rest of it. So they have to make a stand for working people. I mean, I guess what Keir Starmer would say uh, is that he's looked at the last uh, election results when there was a more left-wing leader uh, and it was a catastrophic set of results uh, for the Labour Party and that it's hit up to him to try and re-engage with some of those people who turned away from Labour. Yeah, some of those people that have turned away from Labour are the people who have not got any decent job security in this economy. Now, if he wants to go back to the red wall and now the blue wall, he's got to make a connection with working people. And one of those things is about the fact that there's no decent housing being built by councils, the fact that people cannot rely on an income, and the fact that they're underpaid. And this is a crisis, and it's time for Keir Starmer to stand up for our people. OK, just uh, finally, um, you have previously said that you can't rule out four-day uh, strikes. Are you concerned about what a four-day strike could look like uh, for this country. So, you know, for example, you know, if they could lead to even the lights going out because of a disruption to services, Drax Power Station in North Yorkshire servicing millions of homes, and there's only a certain amount uh, of, uh, it, of, of, of power that it can stockpile. Are you concerned? I'm about concerned what that about disruption. I don't want disruption, and nor do my members, but they don't want to see their conditions stripped out, and they don't want to live under an ever, ever present threat of job cuts. Network Rail have already announced that 2,500 of my people will be made redundant. They've already made 1,500 job cuts in that company. And that's the first instalment. 
Now, we're going to see a stripped out, dehumanised railway if we're not careful. If the companies want to come back to the table and work with us to get a proper settlement, we can do that very quickly. And Ge it wouldn't need to be any strikes at all. Do you think it genuinely could lead to the lights going out? I've got no idea. It depends how long the strike goes on, if there is strike action. And it's up to the government to give a mandate to the companies that they can settle this dispute. How long could the strikes be? They could go on for a very, very long time because there's no sign at the moment that anybody's backing down on their side of the table. I mean, does they that are mean pushing... days, weeks? What... Well, we'll decide that as we go. We want to make the strike action, if it happens, as effective as possible from our point of view. But just you are prepared to strike for long enough that it could affect the power supply if you don't get you to have your demands met? Is that... Our members are prepared to take effective strike action in pursuit of a settlement of this dispute. I've got no idea how long that will take. And I can't determine from here what the, what the outcomes and side effects of that will be.